It was just over a year ago that I took the night security job at Wilson's department store. I had been out of work for several months at that point. Ever since the factory where I had worked for 15 years abruptly closed down and moved operations overseas, I had struggled to find steady employment. At first, I lived off my meager severance package, but that ran out quickly. I took odd jobs here and there, stocking shelves at the grocery store, mowing lawns, doing minor home repairs for elderly folks in the neighborhood, but nothing stuck or provided enough income to cover all my bills. By the time I saw the Help Wanted ad for a night security guard posted in the window of Wilson's, I was desperate. My electricity was about to be shut off, and I was two months behind on rent. The prospect of being homeless hung over me. I had passed Wilson's department store countless times in my life, but had never shopped there. It was one of those old, dusty places that had somehow held on when flashier chains and malls took over the retail scene. I knew it couldn't be doing great business anymore, just by peering in the windows at the lackluster displays and utter absence of customers most days. Still, landing a full-time job with regular hours and a steady paycheck, even at a failing store, sounded pretty good at this point. I guessed that Wilson's was likely understaffed and having trouble filling positions, especially for off-hour shifts. Why else resort to a help-wanted sign that looked like it had been printed on a dot matrix printer in 1985? The posted schedule was perfect for me. I had always been a night owl anyway. Working 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. would allow me to get some needed sleep during the day when my noisy neighbors were at work. And I certainly didn't have any hot social life to hamper by taking evening shifts. That Saturday, I built up my courage and walked into Wilson's for the first time in my life, making a beeline for the front office. I inquired about the security guard job, trying to sound more confident than I felt. The bored-looking manager named Bill glanced me up and down, as if shocked that anyone had actually responded to the help-wanted posting. After a few perfunctory questions, Bill offered me the job. The pay was minimum wage with no benefits, but I wasn't in a position to negotiate. I gratefully accepted the position, filling out paperwork on the spot. Bill explained my duties, basically locking up, turning out lights, and keeping an eye out for burglars or vandals after closing time. Seemed simple enough. This would hold me over while I continued to look for more gainful employment. Bill told me to come back on Monday at 7 p.m. to start my first shift. As I stepped outside and began the walk home, I felt an immense sense of relief. I had bought myself some time and had narrowly escaped homelessness. Maybe this could even be the turnaround I needed to get my life back on track. My optimism soared for the first time in months. If only I had known that my first night on the job would be a terrifying experience that still haunts my dreams. On Monday, I arrived at 6.45 p.m., 15 minutes early for my 7 o'clock shift. The store had just closed for the day, and the last few customers were trickling out into the darkening parking lot. I went in through the employee's entrance at the back of the building. The aging linoleum squeaked under my shoes as I made my way past the break room and through a dingy stockroom area. Emerging onto the main sales floor, I took it all in. Wilson's was even more depressing than I remembered from my brief interview. The store couldn't have seen a remodel since the 1970s, with its faded carpet, drab decor, and general air of neglect. Following the instructions I'd been given, I made my way up to the security desk next to the front entrance. It was a small office area crammed into a nook beside the main doors, containing a desk and chair, a filing cabinet, a small TV monitor showing grainy security camera feeds, and a rack of keys. I settled into the squeaky desk chair and familiarized myself with the control panel for the alarm system I'd be responsible for arming and disarming each day. There was also a heavy flashlight, a set of two-way radios, and the master key ring full of keys to unlock all the display cases. As I was taking stock of everything, I noticed a folded piece of paper tucked under the front corner of the desk. Curious, I pulled it out. It was a printed list of about a dozen numbered rules. I chuckled and rolled my eyes as I read the strange list. Always lock the mannequins in their display cases after closing. 
Check that all doors are locked before the shift begins. Do not leave your post until the morning manager arrives at 7 a.m. Make hourly patrols of the sales floor and stock rooms. If you see any suspicious activity, call 911 immediately. If the power goes out, use the backup generator behind the store. Monitor the security cameras closely. Never make eye contact with a mannequin after midnight. All employees must be out of the building by 8 p.m. sharp. If you hear knocking or tapping from the mannequin cases, ignore it. Do not bring food, drink, or mobile devices to the security desk. Report any abnormal events directly to Bill in the morning. I had to laugh at the ridiculous rules about the mannequins. It was obviously a prank list left behind to spook any new security guards. I made a mental note to ask Bill about it in the morning to give him a hard time. Crumpling up the paper and tossing it into the wastebasket, I settled in to watch the monitors as my first overnight shift began. At 7 p.m. on the dot, I started my rounds, beginning with a walkthrough of the entire building to make sure I was alone and that all non-emergency lights were off and doors locked. I moved methodically from one department to the next, verifying I was the only living being left on the premises. My rubber-soled shoes squeaked loudly on the scuffed tile floors as I patrolled past endless product displays. It was actually kind of eerie being in the massive store all alone at night, and I was glad for the occasional buzz of the fluorescent lights to break the silence. By the time I completed the full circuit of the first and second floors and returned to the security desk, it was approaching 9 p.m. According to the rules, all other employees were supposed to be out by 8 p.m. I checked the monitors again to confirm the store was empty, except for me. On the screens, everything looked still and shadowy. The only movement came from a flickering overhead light on the junior section on camera 4. Settling back into the chair, I picked up a magazine someone had left behind and thumbed through it idly. Aside from making the hourly patrols required by the rules, there wasn't much for me to do during these long overnight shifts. I didn't mind having time alone with my thoughts, though. This job certainly beat trying to sleep through my neighbor's loud music and barking dogs like I did during the day. A little before 10 p.m., I started my second round of patrols, retracing my earlier route. The store felt even more silent and creepy this time around. As I passed the men's department, the eyeless gazes of the stiff mannequins seemed to follow me. Of course, I knew it was just my overactive imagination fueled by that silly prank list of rules. One of them had mentioned not making eye contact with mannequins after midnight. I scoffed aloud, the sound echoing in the still aisles. Winding my way through ladies' wear, I checked that all the standing mannequins were locked securely in their display cases. That was another of the bizarre rules from the list. As far as I could tell, all the motionless plastic figures were accounted for in their glass-enclosed compartments. The shadows made their still forms seem almost eerie, but I shrugged it off and continued my patrol. By the time I finished the full hour-long circuit, my watch read 11.15 p.m. I grabbed a snack from the vending machine and headed back to the security desk. Settling into the chair, I propped my feet up and focused on the monitors again. The empty sales floor remained quiet and still. All in all, it had been an uneventful first shift so far. I made a few more rounds over the next couple of hours, breaking up the monotony by chatting with the board operator whenever I called in my status as required. By the time I finished my 11 p.m. patrols, I was starting to feel drowsy. I'd have to limit myself to one more round before grabbing a nap. Just two and a half hours until the morning manager arrived, and I could finally head home to get some real sleep. Starting the last patrol, I decided to reverse my route and work from the back up towards the front entrance. The store felt chilly and even more lifeless this late at night. As I circled past cosmetics, I thought I saw slight motion in my peripheral vision. I quickly turned, but it was just a tall mannequin near the perfume counter. Laughing at myself, I intentionally avoided making eye contact with its blank face, recalling another of those silly rules. I moved quicker through the rest of the ladies' wear, ready to be back at my desk. As the elevators came into view signaling I was nearing the home stretch, 
I froze in my tracks. The hair on my arms stood up as my eyes registered what I was seeing. One of the mannequins that was supposed to be locked in its case was standing there silently next to the escalators, its glossy head turned towards me. I was halfway through my patrols, as I wound my way through the empty aisles and departments, my footsteps echoed through the cavernous space. The only other sounds were the occasional buzzing of fluorescent lights and the hum of the HVAC vents as they pumped warm air into the chilly building. Making my way through ladies' wear, I scanned the aisles mechanically, shining my flashlight into the forest of clothing racks and displays. The beam illuminated glossy store mannequins scattered around the department, locked away in their glass cases just as the rules had instructed. Their frozen, featureless faces were skewed into exaggerated smiles as they modeled the latest fashions. As I swept the flashlight beam over a cluster of mannequins in cocktail dresses, a flicker of movement suddenly caught my eye. I quickly pivoted on my heel, snapping the flashlight back towards the spot. Who's there? I called sharply, my voice reverberating down the aisle. Silence answered. Stepping cautiously forward, I held my breath and listened. Only the ambient hum of the store filled the air. My flashlight revealed nothing amiss in the ladies' wear section. Shaking my head, I figured it must have been a trick of the light. My bored mind was just playing games on me in the empty store. Chuckling at my skittish overreaction, I turned forward again to continue my patrol. I froze in surprise as my flashlight illuminated a mannequin standing directly behind me, just inches away, where no mannequin had been before. I stumbled back in astonishment, shock racing through my system at the sight of the humanoid figure looming in the shadows right where I had just been. Jesus, I gasped, pressing a hand over my thudding heart. I took deep breaths to calm my rattled nerves, casting the beam over the mannequin's neutral, inhuman face with its blank eyes and plastic smile. There was no doubt that it was one of the mannequins from a nearby display. It was wearing an elegant black evening gown, and its stiff arms were fixed in an unnatural pose. But how had it gotten there? I could have sworn the space behind me was empty just seconds ago. Unease crept up my spine as I stared at the still figure. Maybe this was another prank by one of the other employees to mess with the new guy. But who would have taken the time to unlock a mannequin from its case and move it here silently, just to give me a scare? No one else was supposed to be in the store this late. I shook off the paranoid thoughts. I must have just overlooked the mannequin standing there in the shadows. Trying to appear nonchalant despite the lingering adrenaline, I stepped around the mannequin and continued on my way. But I couldn't resist glancing back over my shoulder nervously. The mannequin hadn't moved, its pale shape now receding into the darkness down the aisle. Letting out a shaky breath, I quickened my pace towards the front of the store. I just needed to finish this patrol and get back to my desk. Passing menswear, I averted my eyes from the mannequin's vacant stairs, moving briskly between the rows of suits and dress shirts. The beam of my flashlight swept jerkily ahead of me, slicing through the shadows as I went. Turning the corner towards housewares, a large figure at the end of an aisle caught my eye. I halted, clutching the flashlight like a weapon. Had one of the mannequins moved again? I stood frozen for a moment, pulse racing. Nothing stirred. It was just another mannequin where it was supposed to be, stationed in the mock living room display. Feeling foolish, I let out a tense laugh and continued on once more. My ramped-up imagination was playing tricks on me now. The long overnight hours were making me jumpy. In the darkened electronics section, I could have sworn I saw shifting shapes moving between aisles as I passed. But when I doubled back to check, there was nothing there. Just lifeless televisions and appliances, and the watching faces of plastic store mannequins eerily illuminated in the glow of display screens. By the time I hustled back to the fluorescent-lit safety of the security desk, I was on edge. I couldn't seem to shake the feeling of unseen eyes tracking me from the shadows as I made my rounds. Sitting heavily into the creaky chair, I ran both hands down my face, exhaling slowly. 
glancing at the balled-up piece of paper containing the absurd store rules in the trash can, I felt a sense of doubt. Maybe those strange rules weren't just a silly prank after all. Over the next hour, I scanned the video feeds and tactical layout maps with extra care. Nothing seemed out of place. The store remained still and quiet. Just to be certain, I crossed to the maintenance room and double-checked that the metal mannequin cases were all locked securely, preventing any tampering. Probably unnecessary, but it eased my mind a bit. When the time came for the next patrol, I set out with determined rationality. I moved at a measured pace through each department, taking care not to react to every shape my peripheral vision detected. As expected, the store was empty and undisturbed. The mannequins stood fixed in their poses, sealed away behind glass and forgotten at this late hour. As I methodically inspected aisle after aisle, I gradually relaxed and shook off the night's earlier tricks of the mind. The fluorescent lights of the security desk welcomed me back an hour later as I pushed aside the memories of moving shadows and watching eyes. Settling into the chair, I leaned back with a weary but satisfied sigh. After about thirty minutes I began another patrol. As I walked the same route, I felt slightly sheepish about my earlier unrest. As I strode down the central aisle, my flashlight caught a pale figure stepping out silently from behind a rack of coats. I gasped and froze in my tracks, pulse skyrocketing. The mannequin from ladies' wear stood twenty feet away, its head swiveling unnaturally to face me. Adrenaline flooded my veins. It couldn't be. I blinked hard, willing the illusion away. But its glossy form remained, stock still and watching, waiting. Fighting the instinct to sprint wildly for the exit, I forced myself to back slowly towards the security desk. The mannequin didn't move, continuing its silent observation. As soon as I felt safely around the corner, I broke into a panicked run and didn't stop until I was in the light of the office. Slamming and locking the door behind me, I collapsed into the chair panting hard, terrified eyes glued to the video monitors. All remained still and empty as it should be. But I knew what I saw. As I settled back into the creaky desk chair after my latest round of patrols, an uneasiness continued creeping through me. My pulse still felt rapid, and my palms sweaty from the strange sighting of that mannequin where it shouldn't have been. I tried taking deep breaths to calm myself and clear my head. It was just my overactive mind playing tricks in the empty, shadowy store late at night. That's what I told myself, at least. But there was a growing sense of doubt I couldn't quite shake. My thoughts kept returning to that eerie mannequin seeming to move on its own, appearing behind me when seconds before there was only air. I glanced down at the balled-up piece of paper containing the rules in the trash can. What if it wasn't just a silly prank list after all? Maybe there was a real reason for instructions like always lock the mannequins in their display cases after closing and never make eye contact with a mannequin after midnight. A nervous laugh escaped my lips. Surely mannequins coming to life was impossible. Right? But then, how to explain what I thought I saw? Checking my watch, I saw it was approaching midnight. I studied the grainy monitor feeds closely, looking for any other strange activity. Everything appeared still and in order. Too still, maybe. The dead silence and watchful plastic gazes of the mannequins already had me unnerved. I dreaded venturing back out into the store. With a nervous sigh, I heaved myself up from the chair and grabbed the flashlight in preparation for the next round of patrols. I decided to put fresh batteries in it just in case, needing the reassurance of its bright beam cutting through the cavernous darkness. Who knows what might be lurking in the shadows now, waiting for me. Pushing open the office door, I swept the flashlight in a wide arc across the sales floor. Only hushed stillness continued. The soft shuffle of my footsteps across carpet and tile sounded deafening compared to the previous absence of sound. Each time the HVAC kicked on with a muted whir, I flinched slightly. I strained all my senses, alert to any stimuli that seemed out of place. As I passed through menswear, 
The shuffle of fabric made me whip around in alarm before realizing it was just my coat brushing a rack of jackets. Get a grip, I told myself. But my heart continued pounding against my ribs. In housewares, I thought I detected motion in my periphery, like a dark form ducking behind a display. I swept my flashlight beam towards it, but found nothing. Just more watching mannequins and inanimate objects faintly illuminated in the dim glow. A prickle of anxiety ran across my scalp. I was wound up so tight that everything was setting off my flight or fight response. The empty store almost felt like it was silently mocking me, knowing I was the only living being pacing its aisles like a frightened mouse in a maze startling at every innocuous sound and shadow. As I hurried through the gloom towards the front of the store again, I couldn't resist the urge to glance back over my shoulder frequently. Each time, the corridor behind me remained empty, still littered with geometric shadows, but no sign of anything that moved or watched me go. At least, not that I could detect. Approaching the central aisle once more, the glow of the security office called me, but to reach it, I had to pass within a few yards of the towering glass cases housing the female mannequins. Heart lodged in my throat, I crept closer, hyper aware of them just on the other side of the glass. I kept my gaze fixed straight ahead as I rushed past the cases, not daring to even glimpse at the mannequins imprisoned within. A pristine hand or pale forehead entered my peripheral vision at one point, as I passed a glossy figure posed elegantly in evening wear behind the glass. Its graceful arm was lifted, one manicured finger seeming to point directly at me accusingly. A powerful instinct warned me not to meet its vacant stare. One of the strange rules had mentioned never making eye contact after midnight. Whether it was midnight yet or not, I heeded that internal voice screaming at me not to look. Almost past the cluster of cases, I was so focused on not catching the gaze of any mannequins that the scuff of a shoe on the tile behind me made me yelp in alarm. Spinning, I expected to find one of the mannequins standing there, free from its case. But there was nothing, just the empty aisle which I'd already cleared. Letting out a shaky breath, I shook my head angrily. I was letting this empty building and its inanimate occupants get the better of me. I turned forward again and continued on towards the security desk, just paces away now, the unseeing stares of the mannequins prickling the back of my neck. Safely back in the office with the door firmly shut behind me, I collapsed into the chair and raked my hands through my hair. This was ridiculous. I was jumping at every creak and shadow thanks to an overactive imagination. There had to be some reasonable explanation for that one mannequin seeming out of place earlier, and I needed to get my paranoid mind under control before it spun any more wild what-if scenarios about lurking living mannequins. Glancing at my watch, I saw it was now 12.05 a.m. A small, uneasy chuckle escaped me. Well, I had survived past midnight at least. Settling back into the chair with a bottle of water, I forced myself to take slow, calming sips. Just ride out the remaining hours here uneventfully, head home to a soft bed, and return tomorrow to politely ask Bill for an explanation about the odd rules as a laugh, I told myself. All would be well. Leaning forward, I scrutinized the video monitor feeds closely once more. Everything continued still and orderly in the vacant departments. Around 1 a.m. I geared up mentally for another required round through the store, time to put my irrational fears to rest once and for all. Venturing out cautiously, flashlight in one slightly trembling hand, I first made my way upstairs to the second level, which housed the children's, furniture, and bedding sections. Up here, the signs of aged neglect were even more apparent, with scuffed floors and peeling wallpaper in places. Dust layered some of the furnishings and clothing racks. Clearly, this floor didn't get much traffic even when the store was open. I swept my flashlight systematically across the floor as I patrolled, searching for anything out of place. The mannequins stood around the floor, but all seemed to be where they should be. 
no lurking figures waiting to frighten me this time. Nevertheless, I finished my patrol of the upper level practically at a jog, skin crawling with the sense of unseen eyes tracking me until I descended the stairs again. Back on the main floor, I just had to get through ladies' wear and the front end one more time, then I could retreat to my desk again. I moved through cosmetics and jewelry, senses straining for the slightest stimulus, but only the echoes of my own soft footsteps answered. Entering ladies' wear once more, I stopped briefly as the beam of my flashlight illuminated the tall glass cases and their still, glossy occupants. I tightened my grip on the flashlight, widened my stride, and carried on quickly without allowing myself to fixate on any of the mannequins. Just look straight ahead and keep moving, I told myself. A loud snap behind me made me nearly leap out of my shoes and spin around in fright. My heart convinced a mannequin was now pursuing me. But there was only empty space. After a few confused moments, I realized the sound must have come from my own shoe tread, stepping on a plastic anti-theft tag discarded on the tile floor. Letting out a tense breath, I pressed on towards the final stretch. As I neared the front section, the oversized wall clock came into view its minute hand seeming to click forward loudly marking each endless second. It was 12.45 a.m., just 15 more minutes until I could hide away in the office again and try to calm my unraveling nerves. Fifteen minutes felt like an eternity when each minute out on the floor made me certain something was about to leap from the shadows. The occasional bursts of static from my handheld radio nearly made me jump out of my skin multiple times. Each minor sound ratcheted up my growing suspicion that strange events were happening in this quiet building tonight. Turning down the last aisle of men's casual wear, my eyes caught on a shadow stretching towards me. Heart seizing, I snapped my flashlight towards it, certain one of the mannequins had stepped free of its case and was reaching for me. But the bright beam revealed only a tall floor lamp, its shade casting an angular shadow across the aisle. A breath I hadn't realized I was holding escaped my lungs. Get it together, I ordered myself angrily. There was no living terror stalking me through this empty building. It was just my mind taunting me with illusions crafted from shadows and fear. Finishing the last length of aisles, I emerged once more into the glow of the security desk. I checked the time again. 1 a.m. exactly. Feeling like I had survived a gauntlet, I stepped into the office and locked the door securely behind me. Just six more hours to endure. I wasn't sure my nerves could take it, but I had no choice but to try. Settling into the chair, I resumed my watch over the monitors, skin crawling with the sense that something menacing lurked just outside my line of sight. At 1.15 a.m., that lurking dread seemed to manifest before my eyes. Rising on shaky legs from the chair, I stepped closer to the monitor showing the central aisle I had just passed through. There, near the towering glass cases, caught in the edge of the camera frame, was a pale shape I hadn't noticed before. The overhead angle only showed its arm, shoulder, and side of its glossy wigged head. But there was no mistaking the mannequin, standing outside of its case, its blank face seeming to stare directly into the camera right where I had walked just minutes ago. I stumbled back from the monitor, one hand over my mouth to stifle a frightened gasp. It couldn't be possible. But the proof stared back at me from the screen. This was no trick of the light or figment of my imagination. One of the mannequins had somehow freed itself from its display case when I had turned my back and was now lurking steps from me in the darkness. I sank to the floor, as my trembling legs gave out, watching the screen in horror as the truth I had tried to deny sank in fully. The rules had been no prank after all. I had no idea of their intent, but the rules had warned clearly never to make eye contact with a mannequin after midnight. I recalled the faceless gazes tracking me from the darkness during my patrols. A cold spike of dread lanced through my chest. Whatever their purpose, it could not be good. My instincts screamed at me to make a break for the exit now, while I still could. But glancing at the other camera feeds, 
I could see more ghostly figures detaching themselves from the shadows in ladies' wear and men's wear. Three, five, seven. They were emerging rapidly, creeping through aisles and blocking any clear path to escape. A strangled cry of fear tore from my throat as I watched helplessly. I was trapped in here with them. My only refuge was the locked security office, but I knew it was just a matter of time before they found me cowering there. I desperately tried to control my panicked breathing and think. Why had I ignored the rules? Why hadn't I taken them seriously and fled this place at the first sign of trouble earlier in the night? And how could they possibly be moving under their own power? None of it made any logical sense. The slam of a mannequin's palm against the office door made me nearly jump out of my skin. My heart seized as more heavy blows landed. They had found me and were now testing the door barricading me inside. Frantically, I sent a 911 text, knowing any response was still hours away if it even went through. The battery symbol on my phone blinked red. I was on my own. Backing away from the rumbling door, I wildly searched the room for potential weapons or an escape route. The desk chair. I wedged it under the door handle, reinforcing the lock. The blows ceased as whatever was outside seemed to reconsider its approach. But I knew the chair wouldn't hold them for long once they returned. Creeping on shaky legs to the back exit, I slowly cracked the door and peered out. My guts turned to ice. Standing motionless down the storage area corridor were two more mannequins, their backs to me. My way out was blocked. Pulling the door silently closed again, I pressed trembling hands to my mouth, stifling a panicked sob. I was well and truly trapped now. Soon they would find a way in and corner me like prey. Racking my brain for options, I suddenly recalled the security system control panel on the desk. Lunging for it, I entered the emergency lockdown code, steel roll-down gates immediately descending over the front entrances. Containing them inside was my only play left. An ear-splitting screech of rage seemed to shake the very building, with no human vocal cords capable of producing the chilling sound. The mannequins knew I had sealed the exits. I checked the monitors and saw several converging on the front gates, seeking any weaknesses. One hurled itself against the metal grate over and over, the dull thuds echoing through the building. But the gates held firm. My moment of hope was short-lived. More mannequins were now stalking the main aisles, twitching and swiveling their heads in disconcerting, inhuman ways. I had only temporarily contained them, not stopped them. Their button eyes gleamed as they swept the shadows, coordinated and hunting as a pack for me. The noise at the office door abruptly resumed, and the chair began to splinter. I cast about in desperation for anything I could use to barricade or defend myself. In a bottom drawer, I found a heavy wooden baseball bat, likely left by a long-departed security guard. Gripping it with white knuckles, I retreated into the farthest corner and waited for the inevitable. With an ear-splitting crack, the chair gave way and the door burst open. In the hallway's dim glow stood a female mannequin in a little black dress, her wig slightly crooked. She tilted her head unnaturally and peered into the dark office, seeming to look directly at my hiding place. Then she began to step inside. I wanted to scream or faint or run, but fear had paralyzed my muscles. All I could do was grip the bat and watch in silence as she approached. She stepped smoothly, each click of her limbs moving was loud in the dead quiet. I held my breath, praying she couldn't see me cowering in the shadows. But she crossed directly to my corner, head swiveling and probing the darkness. Then I saw it the faint beam of moonlight through the window glittering in her glassy eyes. They had no pupils, yet somehow she could see me. With a creak of plastic, her glossy red lips parted into a nightmarish grin. Bearing her perfectly molded teeth, she reached for me with grasping synthetic fingers. With a primal roar, I swung the bat with every ounce of adrenaline-fueled strength in my body, 
It connected with her head with a sickening crack, snapping it clean off. It hit the far wall and rolled away. Her decapitated body paused, as if still processing. Taking the advantage, I barreled past her towards the door, swatting away her blindly grasping hands as I fled into the darkness outside. Racing blindly through aisles and displays, I turned a corner and skidded to a stop. Five more were blocking my path. In unison, their heads swiveled with that unnatural motion to stare me down. I retreated slowly, brandishing the bat as a meager threat. With eerie coordination, they fanned out in a semicircle, backing me toward a dead-end aisle. There was no escape. I was surrounded and outnumbered five to one. Seeing a fire extinguisher on the wall, I grabbed it and hit the closest mannequin right in its grinning face at point-blank range. It staggered back, temporarily blinded by the cloud of chemicals. Seizing the gap, I picked up the bat and I slipped past the others, my sides grazing their outstretched fingers. Almost free, another pale figure lunged from the darkness ahead. I dodged purely on instinct, hearing its nails rake across the brick wall in a shower of sparks as it narrowly missed my throat. Dropping the spent extinguisher, I sprinted on burning legs through the maze of displays. Their pursuit echoed through aisles, sometimes drawing closer, other times fading as I desperately tried to lose them. But always they reappeared around the next corner, hurting me like prey. I was tiring rapidly, lungs heaving for oxygen. They seemed capable of continuing their terrible hunt all night long without stopping. I stumbled into menswear in a panicked haze. Glancing wildly around for any escape, I spotted a door marked Employees Only. Shouldering through it, I found myself in a long storage room lined with metal shelves. At the far end, a door stood slightly open leading to freedom outside. With a sob of relief, I raced for it, nearly there. But at the last instant, a mannequin flung itself from the shadows and slammed its body against the exit. I recoiled backward, fending it off with weakening swings of the bat still clenched in my hands. Its head distorted where I had battered it, features melted and elongated into a macabre mask. It kept pressing forward, backing me down the room. More figures filed silently in behind it, cutting off any hope of circling back. I continued retreating until my shoulders hit the cold metal shelves at the dead end. I was well and truly cornered now. The rules. My foggy mind suddenly fixed on them. The rules had warned me. Why hadn't I fled at the first sign of trouble? My rational mind had refused to accept the surreal danger spelled out so clearly until it was too late. And now I would pay the ultimate price for not believing. As the mannequins closed in around me like pale ghouls, I sank to my knees in surrender. I had no fight left. Stealing myself for the inevitable agony, I closed my eyes and prayed for the end to come quickly. But then, crouched in the dead-end storage room, I felt a spark of defiance pierce through the fear and despair. I wasn't going down without a fight. Gripping the bat tightly in slick palms, I rose unsteadily to my feet. The crowded mannequins seemed to react with surprise at my sudden movement. Seizing the split-second advantage, I charged forward with a hoarse battle cry, swinging the bat wildly. I smashed the head of the nearest mannequin straight off its shoulders in a spray of shards. Its body wobbled for a moment before toppling over. Its fellow creatures recoiled slightly at the violence, creating a slim gap to escape. I didn't hesitate barreling straight towards freedom. Arms clawed at me from both sides as I ran through, clutching and tearing at my clothes. I elbowed them aside and kept pumping my legs. At last, I burst from the storage room into the darkened aisles of the sales floor. But my hope was short-lived. More of them converged from side aisles to cut me off. I skidded to a stop, nearly losing my footing on the slick tile. No clear path remained. I was surrounded on all sides. With clicking joints they closed in, backing me against a towering display of smartwatches and fitness trackers. I swung the bat desperately, but each swing took more effort as my energy waned. 
Finally, one lunged within range, and I cracked the bat across its chest, caving in the hollow torso but failing to stop its advance. Its fingers wrapped around my wrist, twisted, and wrenched the bat away with inhuman strength. It clattered to the floor as I cried out in pain, clutched in the creature's grip. Its free hand closed on my throat. Gagging, I ripped a tracker from an adjacent shelf and smashed it into the side of the mannequin's head repeatedly until its face caved in and it dropped away. I doubled over wheezing, but immediately spun to confront the next wave. Backpedaling away, I grabbed anything I could to try to hold them at bay. Watches, ties, and belts all became weapons. But nothing slowed them for long. More replaced every single one destroyed. Frantic for escape, I ran down the only clear path but found myself funneled into the housewares section. My shoes slipped on the tiled floor as I wove between displays, hoping to lose my pursuers. But their footsteps clicked steadily behind me, never relenting. Just when I thought my lungs would burst, I spotted it. Another door marked employees only, just paces away. I didn't hesitate, hurtling through it and slamming it closed behind me. Another storage room, perhaps? Freedom? I didn't care. I sprinted as fast as I could and threw the door open. Quickly, I turned around and closed it shut. I slumped against the door, heaving for air. But before I could even take in my surroundings, fists pounded relentlessly on the other side. In seconds, they would break through. Eyes darting wildly, I grabbed boxes and chairs, piling them in front of the door. It wouldn't last long, but might buy me a minute or two. My makeshift barricade jumped and thudded as the mannequins continued to relentlessly hammer away at the door. Soon they would be through. But where to even run to in here? I raised my head and my heart dropped into my shoes. Towering rows of shelves stretched endlessly before me into oblivion. I'm in a warehouse or distribution center. No way out. With a final thunderous smash, the doorframe gave way and the obstacles tumbled aside as pale hands reached through the breach. Their heads craned unnaturally, dead eyes seeking me out in the darkness. In that chilling moment, I knew there would be no escape. I was exhausted and lost in this enormous warehouse. They would run me to the ground before long. But if this was truly the end, I swore I would not make it easy for them. Backing deeper among the maze of shelves, I searched desperately for anything to wield to take a few more down with me. Rows of tools hung on a far wall. I grabbed a heavy metal wrench. It would have to do. At the crossroads of aisles, I made my stand, waiting for the first mannequin face to emerge from the shadows. One crept slowly into view, as if knowing I was trapped. My chest heaved from fear and adrenaline. I would only get one shot at this. Letting loose a roar of rage, I charged straight at the creature. Taken off guard, it stumbled backward, limbs flailing. I battered its head and body relentlessly with the wrench until the mannequin lay in shattered pieces at my feet. Panting, I turned to find three more converging on my position. They seemed to study me cautiously now, wary of my reckless fury. Good. Let them fear me, too. With a defiant scream, I flung myself at the small group, swinging my weapon wildly. They lifted their arms to shield their faces from my blows. One stumbled backward and I continued forward, swinging the wrench in vicious arcs despite the burning protest of my shoulders. Another fell beneath my onslaught, crumbling to scattered limbs and chunks of plaster-like material. But as I destroyed two, Five more emerged from the shadows to replace them. For each one I managed to take down, more appeared. I was hopelessly outnumbered and surrounded on all sides within the endless aisles. But still, I refused to stop fighting. My rough breath sounded harshly in my ears over the thuds and cracks of the wrench smashing home over and over. Sweat and blood ran in my eyes. I knew each blow took me closer to collapsing, but my fury overruled all self-preservation. I would destroy as many as I could before the end. With an ear-splitting screech, three mannequins rushed me at once from different angles. 
My wrench swung in a wide arc, but they were inside its radius before I could strike. Fingers like steel bands gripped my arms and legs, lifting me effortlessly off the floor. The wrench tumbled from my grasp as I cried out in frustration and rage, thrashing violently against their unbreakable hold. But their blank faces and dead eyes showed no emotion, no reaction to my hopeless struggles. Step by step they carried me back through the warehouse. I shouted obscenities, screamed myself hoarse, and pounded at their limbs. All useless. Finally, they reached a dark corner and flung me roughly to the cold concrete floor. I tried to rise, but my traitorous legs buckled, muscles jelly after being pushed to their limits. Choking in the air, I watched as they formed a tight ring around me. So this was it. The end. All my raging defiance was for nothing. I had never stood a chance against their numbers. They would never stop coming for me. Nothing could stop them or hold them back. As I knelt there shivering and gasping on the icy floor, my manic desperation burned away, leaving only bone-deep exhaustion and defeat. What did they want from me? In the end, it didn't really matter, I supposed. My struggles were over. Then, one mannequin stepped forward from the ring. Larger than the others, it had likely been on display in the front windows enticing shoppers inside. Now stained dark in places with my blood, its exaggerated smile almost held a taunting edge. Slowly it extended one rigid arm towards me, fingers opened wide. A whimper escaped my throat as I cowered back. This was it then. This featureless ghoul would be my final merciless executioner. Unable to even crawl away on tired limbs, I closed my eyes as the mannequin's hand moved closer. Suddenly, an ear-splitting beeping rang out, echoing deafeningly in the cavernous space. Startled, my eyes flew open again. The mannequins in the surrounding ring jerked and twisted in an almost human-like reaction of surprise. Even my executioner hesitated, its outstretched hand frozen inches from my throat. It took my overwhelmed mind a few seconds to recognize the sound. The building's fire alarm system was blaring on every level. Had a stray spark from my fight accidentally triggered it? Or was help somehow on the way? It hardly mattered. This was my last desperate chance. With a raspy scream, I launched myself forward, knocking the lead mannequin off balance. I didn't dare pause to look back at its recovering companions. Mustering every last drop of strength, I ran like hell through the only gap toward the warehouse exit, glowing red in the distance. The alarms continued hammering my ears as I sprinted for my life down seemingly endless rows of shelves. I expected to feel hands seizing me at any second and dragging me back into the dark nightmare but somehow I broke free from their clutches into the hallway beyond. Blindly, I ran towards the outer doors now in sight. With a final burst, I flung myself through them into the night air, rolling down steps onto cool, dewy grass. Gasping desperate lungfuls, I staggered to my feet once more and limped to a wooded area across the loading zone. There I pressed my aching body behind the thick trunk of an oak tree and held completely still, listening between shrieks of the alarm. No sounds of pursuit rose over the noise. They didn't seem able to follow outside the confines of the store, but I wasn't taking any chances. I remained huddled there as sirens eventually sang in the distance, bringing real help at last. But nothing could make me set foot inside that place ever again. With a groan, I pushed my aching body up from the damp ground and limped away parallel to the tree line. Getting as much distance as I could between me and that house of horrors was my only thought. I didn't dare stop moving or look back until I reached the deserted lot of my apartment complex three blocks away. Winded and wheezing, I stumbled through the dark alley to my unit and collapsed face first onto the sagging couch. I lay there for an unknown amount of minutes just breathing, unable to summon the energy even to peel off my filthy ripped clothes and shoes. Sleep tried to claim me quickly, but my shocked mind kept replaying the horrific events on a frenzied loop. Each time I drifted off, 
visions of dead-eyed mannequins stalking closer in the darkness, jerked me violently back awake. I sat up panting, peering wildly around my dark apartment, half convinced they were closing in on me even here. But of course, I was alone and safe, with only the distant wail of sirens outside to testify that the ordeal had been real. As the first dim rays of the sun began lightening the dirty window, the adrenaline seeped from my system, leaving me utterly depleted. But my exhausted thoughts continued churning over the nightmare, trying to make sense of it all. Had it really happened, or was I losing my mind? How could it be possible that inanimate store mannequins had come to life? I examined my arms and legs again, tracing the purple bruises and red welts left by their vice-like grips. The evidence was irrefutable, impossible as it seemed. Those things had been real and intent on killing me. But why? What had I done to provoke the brutal attacks? And what were they? Wincing, I slowly peeled off my filthy clothing and left them in a pile on the linoleum floor. Moving to the tiny bathroom, I scrubbed every inch of skin raw trying to cleanse away the horror of the past night. But it still felt branded into my mind, unlikely to ever fade completely. As I finally collapsed into my unmade bed in the morning light, I knew any further sleep would be futile. My fried nerves and aching body begged for rest, but my mind was still in fight-or-flight mode after the clothes brush with death. Each time I closed my eyes, mannequins closed in around me from the shadows. Over the next few days, I ate little, spoke to no one, and slept barely a few tortured minutes at a time. Whenever I managed to doze off, I would awaken drenched in sweat from vivid nightmares of hands dragging me back into the dark. Mostly, I just sat for hours staring blankly out the living room window, trying to process it all. But the experience had shattered my understanding of reality. I doubted anyone would even believe me if I tried to explain. At best, they would think I was crazy or delusional. But I knew what had happened in that empty department store after midnight was real. Terrifyingly real. I played out the events over and over in my mind trying to find some rationale or explanation. None came. When the phone rang about a week later, I flinched as if from an electric shock. I hadn't left the apartment or spoken to anyone after calling the store that first morning to quit on the spot. Now I feared it was Wilson's management demanding I explain my abrupt abandonment of my post. But instead, a friendly female voice asked if I was available for immediate work. A 24-hour diner needed an overnight line cook after a recent unexpected departure. Sounded perfect for a night owl like me, she said. The offer was tempting. The busy work might help distract my restless mind and pay a few bills. But could I risk another night shift after what I had endured? My hand trembled as I raised it to decline firmly, but politely. I realized at that moment that I would never again be able to take an overnight job. As desperately as I needed income, I couldn't chance finding myself trapped in a dark building after midnight, dreading what might lurk in the shadows. In the quiet following my refusal, I decided that I would get by somehow on odd day jobs for now. It would be a meager existence, but I had escaped the department store horrors with my life and sanity by some miracle. I could not risk tempting that fate again. The decision eased my mind slightly for the first time. But I knew as long as I lived, part of me would remain trapped in that night, running from the haunting memory I could never explain. The true motives and origins of the murderous mannequins would remain forever unknown to me. All I could do was try to somehow move past the trauma and not let it define the remainder of my days. After weeks of struggle, I began to find some peace again. I took up jogging each morning before sunrise, the only time I could bear being outside in the dark now. The rest of my days I split between a handful of part-time jobs and keeping busy with projects in my apartment. It was a meager living, but it kept my waking hours full and my mind occupied. The nightmares gradually faded in frequency, replaced by an edgy hypervigilance whenever I found myself in dim spaces. I doubt I will ever again feel totally at ease after dusk. 
and so, even just a year later, I still find myself glancing warily at store mannequins when I must go into shops and malls. Their frozen empty gazes never fail to make my heart race. But I will never again gaze into their lifeless eyes after the sun goes down. On certain restless nights, the memories feel more dream than real. But the faded scars on my hands and arms never allow me to fully forget.